Good morning, everyone. Darius Dell here to welcome you to the Hedge Ad Risk Management Morning Macro Call for Wednesday, January 21st, 2015. Before I turn things over to Keith, allow me to briefly touch on asset allocation. Took our cash position up to 56% from 53% day over day. We decreased our U.S. equity position to 5% from 6%. International equities we took down to 2% from 3%. Commodities held flat at 0%. Foreign exchange we took down to 6% from 7%. And fixed income held flat at 31%. As always, if there's any questions, please email QA at hedgeye.com. With that, take it away, Keith. Thanks, Darius, and welcome to the morning show. Again, that asset allocation pie, just to explain it to those of you who've never seen it before, we think of asset allocation as a percentage of our max and on a net basis. So in other, in other words, longs versus shorts. So the max asset allocation that we'll have, uh, again, is 33% or a third of our capital. So you can see fixed income has a 31% position, so almost at its max on a net long basis. So again, we would have shorts and fixed income. We'd be short junk bonds, for example, versus the long bond on the long side. And then we'd be modestly net long US equities. But again, picking the sectors that we like versus those that we don't like is critical on that net position. So that's that. Uh, now, on your top three things today, in my notebook, global macro, top three things, Japan is number one, number two is deflation, and number three is Switzerland. And again, we're not gonna talk about the fine central planning folks who are at Davos. Now, first on Japan, last night, central planning night for the Japanese, and Kuroda basically says, look, yeah, my inflation target, not gonna hit it. So he cut his inflation target to 1% for 2015. We've showed this over and over and over again. It's in slide eight, actually, if the team has it, they could pop it up, to show you the monetary math that the Japanese are trying to achieve. So in other words, they're burning their currency so that they can get some kind of monetary math. In other words, inflation. And again, if they can't get the inflation, then the policy to inflate is not gonna work. So them cutting their inflation forecast is basically an admission of defeat. Now again, what happened on that was the two big trades that have been going the right way for the Japanese central planners went the wrong way. The yen, in other words, went up on that. The Nikkei went down on that. I'd be very careful with those two positions in particular that have been working for quite some time and were less confident, at least until April, which is of course the next central planning meeting for the Japanese uh, that people will definitely be uh, prognosticating ahead of. Now, point number two. Uh, deflation, 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 deflation. If you can't see it in the oil price, obviously you can see it now. Uh, but again, in the commodities index, the CRB commodities index, 19 commodities in that index, it hit a fresh new low, as you can see yesterday on the chart. And again, that's crashing. Just again, a crash is greater than a 20% peak to trough decline. And again, when inflation expectations peaked last year, it was June. The CRB index peaked in June. Break evens peaked in June. Tips peaked, you know, again, they all peaked at the same time. And then the rate of change in expectations for inflation started to become deflationary. So again, deflation, you can play in a lot of different ways. Deflation's bad for commodities. It's bad for the debtors with bad balance sheets that are linked to commodity-oriented cash flows. It's good for you, the consumer at home, who's taking that as a benefit at the gas pump. So again, this makes for a very good long-short setup in global macro, probably the best long short setup that I've seen uh, really since we started the firm, with, which I think in seven years is saying something. Now finally, in Switzerland, you do not want to be long the Swissy uh, stock market. That stock market, again, collapsed on the central plan, and again, the central plan didn't really work in equity market terms. You'll recall that last week, uh, you woke up to the Swiss stock market down 7 8% on the day. Then they bounced it. You can see that bounced to a lower high in the chart, and now back down 2%. So again, the problem here is that the Swiss stock market to start the year is already down 11% and it has no immediate term support on the Swiss market index down to 76.80. And again, if you can pull up a chart there, you can see that that is a long way from Kansas and my name certainly ain't Toto. So those are your top three things. Now, apologies in advance because I have absolutely no voice and I was up all night with many uh, human issues, uh, not the least who are called my health. Uh, but again, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm blessed and fine. But uh, what I'd say about that is that we are actually going to have, this is the morning show, but we're going to have our market marathon next week, January the 27th. Again, I'm going to have some of my friends like Jim Rickards on, who's going to talk about things that are just exploding to the upside right now, like gold. We're going to talk about everything that we talk about, but we're going to talk about it throughout the day. And again, there's a lot to talk about in non-advertising central plan 
defining fan club terms, which is, of course, what we're going to do. We don't have advertisers, by the way, uh, on this show. So that's that. Uh, let's just get into the macro grind. Upside, downside in risk ranges. So again, that's the immediate term. Then I'll give you intermediate term views that overlay that and a little research in between. Uh, looking at the immediate term downside in the S&P 500 now to 1987. That's now support. Uh, 2036, which is a lower high of resistance, is indeed resistance. So you have, in other words, you have 1.7% downside versus 0.7% upside. And again, I like to think of managing risk or trading uh, a book in terms of probabilities. And again, we use Bayesian inference. For those of you who want to do some reading on that, it's called really, you know, the Bayesian inference is using the prior, what already happened, to help you predict the posterior. And again, uh, what I like to do is make good swings at good pitches. So again, if there's more downside than upside, I'm not going to swing at an outside pitch. And again, that's how I think about it. If we're at the low end of the range, I cover and I buy. If we're at the high end of the range, I sell and I short things. So again, that's what we do. I know that that's not what everyone else does, but that's probably why you're listening to us, because at a bare minimum, it's different uh, than what you've been hearing for eons upon eons of your television tubing with the CNBCs of the world. Did I just say that? Yeah, I did. Uh, risk range in the Russell 2000, in case you didn't know, it's weird, you know, Obama last night in the State of the Union, uh, he said, you know, stock market's up, this is up, GDP's up, blah, blah, blah. You know, well, the Russell 2000, which is a pretty good measure of a lot of stocks, is 2,000 stocks instead of the Dow's navel gazing 30, has done absolutely nothing in the last year. You can see the chart. I mean, you, it looks pretty flat to me. I mean, it's had a big 15% drawdown in between all that. Hopefully, you weren't long for that, baby. Uh, but the reality is that that's what's happened. Uh, and again, the Russell 2000 is immediate term support at 1155. The risk range is pretty tight uh, with 1179 resistance. Now, the upside down of the Russell and the S&P is, of course, volatility. Uh, the inverse relationship that is volatility continues. And yes, we continue to be bullish from an intermediate term trend perspective on volatility. We call it volatility's asymmetry. We've been making this call since July when deflation started to appear uh, as a very credible risk. So again, one of the ways to be, a lot of people say, how do I play deflation? Well, you get long the long bond and you get long volatility. Look at that chart of volatility. It's awesome. Uh, again, you want to be long volatility. The current risk range in the VIX, and I'm talking about the front month, is 16 spot 66 to 2306. So in other words, if the central planners in Europe don't deliver enough cow ball tomorrow, you know, you're going to get a breakout to 23 in the VIX at a bare minimum, and you're going to get a breakdown in the S&P towards 1987. So if, if you don't believe that they can execute tomorrow, I would seriously consider that. Navat me, me, uh, this morning, I'm, I, actually, I don't care if I mispronounce their names. Do you think they care about my name? Uh, the reality is a central planner in Europe this morning said, I don't know if you're going to get what you thought that you're going to get tomorrow in European central planning expectations. So watch out for that. Big day tomorrow uh, in macro. And again, look at the risk range in both volatility and U.S equity beta, beta being the S&P 500, uh, when you think about that. Yesterday's uh, advanced decline line, another thing to think about. You think about all the risk factors within the market. There are many. Uh, again, you have to have a process to capture uh, most of them. Advanced decline line. So again, the number, the percentage of stocks going up versus the percentage of stocks going down. On an, a quote unquote up day for the S&P 500, it was up like 0.1%. Uh, there were 38% advancers and 60% decliners. So in other words, the breadth of the market continues to deteriorate. So again, style factors are breaking down, deflation is obvious, bond yields are leading you to lower growth rate expectations, and you're getting more variance at both the sector and at the stock picking level. If you don't know what variance is, look it up. Important term for you to learn, and certainly not on my time today. Uh, looking at yesterday's sectors, uh, it was an, a very bad day for those things uh, that were linked to the financials. We do not like the financials. We don't like the industrials. Uh, again, down day for the KRE index, which is the regional banking index. They don't like lower interest rates. It was a horrible day for the XOP, which is energy stocks. Again, a lot of knife catchers are taking the knife in the eyes right now. Again, we don't want you buying energy. No, we don't want you buying regional banks. It's all the same thing. Deflation equals lower bond yields equals lower in both of those sectors. What we do like is housing, and housing was down a lot yesterday, so we'll get a lot of questions on that. Uh, today, you're, you got a housing starts number that was pretty good. That's a December number. We would expect that the housing numbers continue to improve between now and the spring selling season. And again, our view on lower interest rates is really helpful to refinancings and purchase applications in the housing market. No, it's not consensus, and yes, people chase the housing stocks because they had a big rip in the last three months, but again, if you can buy them on sale, that's what you want to do. I, I'd much rather 
that than buying some kind of social bubble. I mean, no matter how bad my voice is cracking this morning. Uh, and that is what it is. Uh, looking at uh, Asia last night, let's just go around the horn from a global macro perspective. Again, the Japanese failed to convince people that it will work this time. Uh, for those of you who have been keeping score since Paul Krugman said in 1997, to print lots of money and you will cure all your ails, they did that. And it didn't work. Uh, so again, they reminded you last night that it's still not working. And of course, the, the Nikkei was down a half a percent on that in a very disappointing, and I'd call it kind of a wet Kleenex type day. The Kospi, as you know, up barely, but again, the Kospi remains bearish from a trend perspective. Again, Dr. Kospi is broken in as much as Dr. Copper is. Dr. Copper down 1.7% this morning. China, however, uh, get this. Now, if you, could, if you traded this perfectly, like some of the people who never make any mistakes on Twitter, uh, again, Chinese stocks this week, on the day that we had the day off, they were down 7.7%. Then yesterday, they were up 1.8%. And then today, they're up 4.7%. So if you look at what happened this week, nothing happened. I mean, as long as you traded it perfectly, congratulations, and took on all the risks it is, a bunch of Chinese brokers making things up. I mean, things in China are just fantastic, right? Obviously, the only catalyst currently in China is central planning. And again, this is just really a perverse kind of manifestation of all that is central planning out there. And people really, you know, that really is their thesis. Now, looking at Europe this morning, European equities, it's the same thing. I mean, do you seriously watch or listen to anyone on the radio or on TV uh, telling you anything other than some 18th century European central plan is going to save everyone tomorrow? I mean, that's where we're at, you know? I, I, I can think, I'm not American, but I can think of, you know, as a Canadian, I, I studying American history, I can think back of really the 18th century of why Americans really didn't want to do that. Now, that's just them uh, at that point in time, but I wouldn't call you like a free market patriot and at the same time run around saying, because because I'm in the business of being long European equities, I really need central planning. I mean, what they could do here is disappoint. Now, if they don't provide enough cowbell, I really do think that this could be a nasty day in European equities. So we'll have to see what this guy has in his back pocket. Uh, if you ask the Greece stock market, uh, not a lot. Greek stock's down almost 2% this morning, down 5% year to date. Uh, if you ask the Swiss stock market, we already addressed that. Not good things going on if you look underneath the hood. And again, that's how you do macro. You look at the factors within the marketplace. Uh, commodities already talked about what's going on there. If you're looking at risk ranges for the price of oil, we're currently looking at 45 spot 03 as a medium term trade support for WTI with 47 spot 66 resistance. So yes, I've said this a thousand times, I'll say it again. Even if oil does go to 47 spot 66 or 57 spot 66 or 67 spot 66, these guys are not going to be able to uh, do anything other than still go bankrupt. I mean, I'm talking about energy companies that are explicitly tied to 80, 90, 100 dollar oil. You know that, right? I mean, do you know what a borrowing basis is? A borrowing basis? Again, if you're a big energy debtor, you do, and you have to readdress your basis in April. So that's the next big catalyst. The next fall, or shoot a fall rather, in the energy market is indeed the balance sheet. Uh, and the balance sheet will start to break down as they have to address their cost of capital. So again, that's April. Uh, looking forward to that catalyst. We're actually hosting a conference call with an expert on that tomorrow here at Hedgeye on the institutional side. Uh, uh, gold looking at a risk range now. We're tapping the, the we're tapping the top end of the risk range. 1242 support, 1299. So people would say you, love, you, you sent out a couple videos in the last week that said that you know we're turning bullish on gold. Yeah, uh, but I also didn't you know signal buy gold. Now what's the problem there? Well, it's called the human frailty of Keith McCullough. It's called an inability to chase high, and I like to buy them on pullbacks. You know, call me names, call me whatever you want to call me. I got plenty of human frailties. But what I do not like to do is buy at the top end of the range. So currently today, while bullish, gold is at the top end of the risk range. I would love to see a, you know, bringing that, that gold level back down. What I really think gold is front running is the ECB not giving enough cowbell. So follow the bouncing ball. If they don't, the euro bounces. If the euro bounces, the dollar goes down. When the dollar and rates are going down at the same time, US dollar, US interest rates, that is the epicenter of the love for the gold. You don't need the crystal ball for that. You don't need to really uh, you know, call up your inner whatevers and ask yourself any other reason to be bullish on gold. If you have down rates and down dollar at the same time on the same day, that is the epicenter of the bull case for gold. And again, maybe we're going to get that in the next couple days. We'll have to see about that. Don't forget that the Japanese, surprising negatively, was down yen. That's that, or up yen. That's down dollar. That's also bullish for gold. So again, a lot of this stuff to talk about with Jim Rickards 
uh, when we have them in here next week. Uh, looking at 10-year uh, bond yield risk range before I wrap things up, uh, immediate term downside in the 10-year to 1.74%. Do I still love the long bond? Indeed, alongside my Yale hockey tattoo on my back, I might get TLT, uh, and then my wife will probably leave me. Uh, but the reality is that that is what it is. You know, it's a good position. It's working for the right reasons. What is the best way to be long? Global growth slowing and deflation. It remains the TLT, or the long bond, 20 to 30 year duration, long term securities in the debt market. And again, downside 174 on the 10 year. So again, looking for that uh, in as much as anything else. And again, looking at currency markets, we already talked about the N. And then finally, uh, on economic data points, before I take some questions, uh, this is more of a sediment oriented data point. Again, it's a weekly sediment reading from II, uh, institutional investor bull bear spread. So again, you, we subtract the bulls from the bears in the, in the survey, and you currently have, let's see here, you have 49% bulls and you have 17.4% bears, which equates to 3,160 basis points of bullishness in terms of the spread. Now that spread tends to oscillate between 1,000 basis points wide. People are always bullish, but again, 1,000 basis points wide to 4,000 basis points wide. That's kind of the, if you look at the standard standard deviation of risk of the data series, that's what it is. So when you get over 4,000 basis points wide, which it was, by the way, on the week of December the 29th at 2090 in the S&P, perfect signal, uh, that, that's a sell signal, or at least one of the many that you could have had. Uh, again, you don't want to be wearing these 100 point declines in the S&P 500 all the way down all the, all the time. Uh, now you've corrected some of that, you're at 3,160 basis points wide, but people are still naturally buying all the dips. You can see it in the equity futures market, you can see it in, in really uh, S&P futures, so if you look at index and E-minis, still well over 100,000 uh, 100, net long contracts in futures and options. And again, that's the position that the street has had throughout the year. Unfortunately, the street has been short the long bond and long the S&P 500, which is dramatically, I'd say dramatically wrong at this point this year uh, for the year to date. The TLT is up 7% and the S&P is down 2%. Uh, that's not what you wanted to have on. And again, uh, we'd reiterate why you wanted to have on the opposite. So maybe a good spot there is to take some, uh, take some questions. Cool, yeah, just uh, on the TLT <coughs> specifically. Uh, it says the February 2nd dividend date on the TLT looming uh, just when shorts have to capitulate. On Sorry, what date? February 2nd dividend date. Oh, the X dividend date? Um, I don't know if they have to capitulate, but it's a good day to collect your dividend. And again, it's a, it's a good day to collect your coupon payment. Again, that's the beauty of what more beautiful thing could you have? You have a, uh, a security that doesn't, hasn't gone down, for real, uh, and they give you an interest payment. That's the bull case, the return of your capital the return of your capital. So again, if you're a wealthy person, you really need to focus on the return of your capital. Because as you know, from everyone on up to on down, uh, people have made a lot of capital over the years, but they tend to eviscerate some of their capital by buying high and not being thoughtful until they get the pullbacks to buy them lower. And again, that is what it is. I think that, that, that that's why it's so attractive to buy treasuries, because you get the return of your capital. Yep, switching gears here. Is a surge in gold predicting a fall in the US dollar? Well, they're certainly trading uh, in sync on this. I mean, it, it's, it's saying that the dollar's ascent in rate of change terms on a six-month basis. I mean, you have to go back to the 1980s to find a move that the U.S. dollars had to the upside on that. We've explained that quite simply because both the Europeans and the Japanese, the other side of the dollar trade, if you look at the U.S. dollar index, which is a basket of other currencies, uh, you can see that, you know, just an epic move. So what gold going up to me is saying is that the rate of change in the U.S. dollar move to the upside is done. In other words, the acceleration is going to start to decelerate. So again, that's rate of change terms. And again, not a lot of people on Wall Street talk in rate of change terms. In fact, there's still the same old you know, wombats that are talking about things that they did at the bubble in 2000 and 2007. The way that we called those tops, by the way, or at least my process did, was to think in rate of change terms. So when something goes up at a lesser rate, again, you see the slope of the line starting to go second derivative negative then that's negative. So again, I think that's the main thing that gold likes. Uh, obviously, gold loves down interest rates, as it did in 2011. Gold hit its all-time high in 2011 when the dollar was being devalued to 40-year lows and interest rates went to 1.5 on the 10-year bond yield. Yep, yep. Sticking with gold, uh, do you follow that the gold breakout, or do you follow the gold breakout with the buy despite deflationary concerns and the ECB, which could disappoint tomorrow? Yes, I mean, you, you got the ECB tomorrow, so again, I think that's an asset to the, to the gold bull. Uh, if the ECB disappoints, I think that that's good. Another asset to the gold bull is the Federal Reserve coming to our view that they need to push out the dots. In other words, they need to get uh, you know, less hawkish about an interest rate hike in 20, 
15. So if we go throughout 2015 and Janet Yellen doesn't have the spine uh, to raise interest rates, I think that's the next thing for the gold bull, is that the dollar doesn't have the tailwind of this kind of cockamamie interest rate hike expectation. Cool, cool. Uh, we'll try to wrap it up. We're running a little long on time here. Uh, just two more. Europe is outperforming the U.S. in the year to date. Do, would you change your mind on EU stock markets, and if so, why? No. I mean, it might be outperforming, uh, but it's still broken from a trend perspective. The only thing that I've said I like is potentially Germany uh, on pullbacks, because again, Germany, Germany, think of it in deflation terms. So if you really understand deflation, and I've met with a lot of institutional investors, you were with me, we obviously did uh, Thursday and Friday in New York City, talked about deflation in many different ways, because people run different kinds of money. You know, people run diversified funds, they run equity only funds, they run uh, fixed income only funds, they run energy only funds. And the way that you really boil down, no matter what you're doing, if you're looking at, at single stock or single bond securities, is good balance sheet versus bad balance sheet. So in other words, deflation's bad for the debtor. So I want to be short bad balance sheets, I want to be long good balance sheets. So if you think about that in Europe, it's the same point. You want to be long the countries with good balance sheets, good fundamentals, relatively speaking, and you want to be short the bad balance sheets, Greece, Portugal, et cetera. So that's the way that I'd think about it. Again, there are interesting setups developing on a long short basis in Europe, but no way on this side of uh, hell would I be buying uh, Europe with both hands into this ECB event. Speaking of interesting setups on the long short side, it says oil <coughs> is close to 60, down 60% 60 in the last seven months, but major oil companies like Exxon and Royal Dutch Shell are only down 10 to 12% and act like oil is still over $100 a barrel. Uh, would you short any of the majors, and, and also I would add this, would you short the majors and go long oil? Um, I wouldn't go long oil. We're not getting the long oil signal yet. You could get a, I mean, the, the Sisyphean fight, again, you're, if, you, if you remember old Sisyphus, you had to pull, push the rock up the hill, rock would come down on his head. Start all over, push the rock up the hill, comes down on his head. That's like being an oil energy futures trader who keeps buying the damn things. So again, you currently have, just to address the point on what kind, what kind of a bounce can oil really have? Like, I have oil at a maximum bouncing the 56 on an intermediate term basis. You'd say, wow, that'd be a great bounce. But the more likely bounce is to like 47 to 48. Meanwhile, the futures and options position in, in crude oil is massive. I mean, net long. Net long over 326,000 contracts to the long side. It's the most bullishly positioned macro bet currently, which is saying something. Yeah. So a lot of people are sitting there saying the same thing. Now, I typically fade that. Uh, in oil's case right now, I just stay out of the way. On the question of would I short the oil equities or energy equities, absolutely. But I, again, the, the reason why the good balance sheet stocks like Exxon or better balance sheet stocks are outperforming is because a lot of people have to make that relative bet. That can only last for so long. And then they go through the five stages of grief. They have to have these April meetings on their borrowing basis. And then they say, wow, the new price deck for oil is really more like 35 to 58 or 35 to 65. And that's the real problem. That's why energy is setting up and has really underperformed, setting up to underperform for a longer period of time. You'd much rather be long consumer staples and short energy on bounces to overbought highs uh, in the face of that kind of a view. Cool. And then just to clarify, you would stick with a good balance sheet versus bad balance sheet. <coughs> In yes. 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 And then just real quick um, to, to wrap it up, what what are the best trades to make tomorrow in case the ECB disappoints and, and comes through and, and they don't come through per expectations? Well, I think the first thing you do, I already tried to front run it yesterday in real time alerts. We short reshorted France. Um, again, if you don't get socialism, just study a little. Uh, you know, the reality is that this great experiment of central planning, big spending, and socialism has failed, obviously, in France. So that's a place, I mean, if you look at ETFs, EWP, which is Spain, EWI, which is Italy, EWQ, which is France, uh, you know, PGAL, which is Portugal, I mean, these things are just awful looking things. Uh, so it, the second that you get a disappointment, I just like, again, the key was waiting for these things to bounce. Because again, the behavior is predictable. People just naturally think that central planning is the elixir of life. But one day you wake up and it's just not. And tomorrow has every opportunity of being that day. I'm not saying it's going to be. We're talking in probability terms, so don't be a wombat. Think of probabilities rising. The probabilities are rising that that is indeed a fastball right down the pipe. And if that fastball is called deflation, European equities, I think, are going to deflate. Indeed. Lots to do out there, folks. Thanks for joining us this morning. Catch you back here tomorrow, same time. Have a great day out there.